Chapter Thirteen of A Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hide hunting. During the month of June, only two showers fell, which revived the grass, but added not a drop of water to our tank supply or to the river. When the coast winds, which followed, set in, all hope for rain passed for another year. During the residence of the old ranchero at Las Palomas, the Nueces Valley had suffered several severe droughts as disastrous in their effects as a pestilence. There were places in its miles of meandering across our range where the river was paved with the bones of cattle which had perished with thirst. Realizing that such disasters repeated themselves, the ranch was set in order. That fall we branded the calf drop with unusual care. In every possible quarter we prepared for the worst. A dozen wells were sunk over the tract and equipped with windmills. There was sufficient water in the river and tanks during the summer and fall, but by Christmas the range was eaten off until the cattle, ranging far, came in only every other day to slack their thirst. The social gaieties of the countryside received a check from the threatened drought. At Las Palomas we observed only the usual Christmas festivities. Miss Jean always made it a point to have something extra for the holiday season, not only in her own household, but also among the Mexican families at headquarters and the outlying ranchitas. Among a number of delicacies brought up this time from Shepherd's, was a box of Florida oranges, and in assisting Miss Jean to fill the baskets for each wakal, Aaron Scales opened this box of oranges and found a letter, evidently placed there by some mischievous girl in the packery from which the oranges were shipped. There was not only a letter, but a visiting card and a small photograph of the writer. This could only be accepted by the discoverer as a challenge for the sender surely knew this particular box was intended for shipment to Texas, and banteringly invited the recipient to reply. The missive certainly fell upon fertile soil, and Scales, by right of discovery, delegated to himself the pleasure of answering. Scales was the black sheep of Las Palomas. Born of a rich aristocratic family in Maryland, he had early developed into a good-natured but reckless spendthrift, and his disreputable associates had contributed no small part in forcing him to the refuge of a cattle ranch. He had been offered every opportunity to secure a good education, but during his last year in college had been expelled, and rather than face parental reproach, had taken passage in a coast schooner for Galveston, Texas. Then, by easy stages, he drifted westward, and at last, to his liking, found a home at Las Palomas. He made himself a useful man on the ranch, but, not having been bred to the occupation, and with a tendency to waywardness, gave a rather free rein to the vagabond spirit which possessed him. He was a good rider, even for a country where every one was a born horseman, but the use of the rope was an art he never attempted to master. With the conclusion of the holiday festivities and on the return of the absentees, a feature new to me in cattle life presented itself, hide hunting. Freighters who brought merchandise from the coast towns to the merchants of the interior were offering very liberal terms for return cargoes. About the only local product was flint hides and of these there were very few, but the merchant at Shepherd's Ferry offered so generous inducements that Uncle Lance investigated the matter. The result was his determination to rid his range of old, loggy, worthless bulls. Heretofore they had been allowed to die of old age, but ten cents a pound for flint hides was an encouragement to remove these cumberers of the range and turn them to some profit. So we were ordered to kill every bull on the ranch over seven years old. In our roundup for branding, we had driven to the home range all outside cattle indiscriminately. They were still ranging near, 
so that at the commencement of this work nearly all the bulls in our brand are watering from the Nueces. These old residenter bulls never ranged over a mile away from water, and during the middle of the day they could be found along the river bank. Many of them were ten to twelve years old and were as useless on the range as drones in autumn to a colony of honeybees. Las Palomas boasted quite an arsenal of firearms, of every make and pattern, from a musket to a repeater. The outfit was divided into two squads, one going down nearly to Shepherd's, and the other beginning operations considerably above the Ganso. June DeWeese took the downriver end, while Uncle Lance took some ten of us with one wagon on the up-river trip. To me, this had all the appearance of a picnic, but the work proved to be anything but a picnic. To make the kill was most difficult. Not willing to leave the carcasses near the river, we usually sought the bulls coming into water. But an ordinary charge of powder and lead, even when well directed at the forehead, rarely killed, and tended rather to aggravate the creature. Besides, we were compelled, in nearly every instance, to shoot from horseback. It was almost impossible to deliver an effective shot from in front. After one or more unsuccessful shots, the bull usually started for the nearest thicket, or the river. Then our ropes came into use. The work was very slow, for though we operated in pairs, the first week we did not average a hide a day to the man. After killing, there was the animal to skin, the hide to be dragged from a saddle pommel into a hide yard and pegged out to dry. Until we had accumulated a load of hides, Trebusio Leal, our teamster, fell to me as partner. We had with us an abundance of our best horses, and those who were reliable with the rope had the first choice of the remuda. Trebusio was well mounted, but on account of his years was timid about using a rope. And well he might be, for frequently we found ourselves in a humorous predicament, and sometimes in one so grave that hilarity was not even a remote possibility. The second morning of the hunt, Trebusio and I singled out a big black bull about a mile from the river. I had not yet been convinced that I could not make an effective shot from in front, and dismounting, attracted the bull's attention and fired. The shot did not even stagger him, and he charged us. Our horses avoided his rush, and he started for the river. Sheathing my carbine, I took down my rope and caught him before he had gone a hundred yards. As I threw my horse on its haunches to receive the shock, the weight and momentum of the bull dragged my double cinch saddle over my horse's head and sent me sprawling on the ground. In wrapping the loose end of the rope around the pommel of the saddle, I had given it a half-hitch, and as I came to my feet, my saddle and carbine were bumping merrily along after Toro. Regaining my horse, I soon overtook Trebusio, who was attempting to turn the animal back from the river, and urged him to tie on, but he hesitated, offering me his horse instead. As there was no time to waste, we changed horses like relay riders. I soon overtook the animal and made a successful cast, catching the bull by the front feet. I threw Trebusio's horse, like a wheeler, back on his haunches, and on bringing the rope taut, fetched Toro to his knees. But with the strain, the half-inch manila rope snapped at the pommel like a twine string. Then we were at our wit's end. The bull lumbering away, with the second rope noosed over one forefoot and leaving my saddle far in the rear. But after a moment's hesitation, my partner and I doubled on him, to make a trial of our guns. Trebusio, having a favorite old musket, while I had only my six-shooter. Trebusio, on my stripped horse, overtook the bull first and attempted to turn him. But El Toro was not to be stopped. On coming up myself, I tried the same tactics, firing several shots into the ground in front of him, but without deflecting the enraged bull from his course. Then I unloosed a Mexican blanket 
from Tribucio's saddle, and flaunting it in his face, led him like a matador inviting a charge. This held his attention until Tribucio, gaining courage, dashed past him from the rear and planted a musket ball behind the base of his ear, and the patriarch succumbed. After the first few days' work, we found that the most vulnerable spot was where the spinal cord connects with the base of the brain. A well-directed shot at this point, even from a six-shooter, never failed to bring Toro to grass, and some of us became so expert that we could deliver this favorite shot from a running horse. The trouble was to get the bull to run evenly. That was one thing he objected to, and yet unless he did, we could not advantageously attack him with a six-shooter. Many of these old bulls were surly in disposition, and even when they did run, there was no telling what moment they would sulk, stop, without an instant's notice, and attempt to gore a passing horse. We usually camped two or three days at a place, taking in both sides of the river, and after the work was once well under way, we kept our wagon busy, hauling the dry hides to a common yard on the river opposite Las Palomas. Without apology, it can be admitted that we did not confine our killing to the Las Palomas brand alone, but all cumberers on our range met the same fate. There were numerous stray bulls belonging to distant ranches, which had taken up their abode on the Nueces, all of which were fish to our net. We kept the brand tally of every bull thus killed, for the primary motive was not one of profit, but to rid the range of these drones. When we had been at work some two weeks, we had an exciting chase one afternoon in which Enrique Lopez figured as the hero. In coming into dinner that day, Uncle Lance told of a chase after a young Ladino bull with which we were all familiar. The old ranchero's hatred to wild cattle had caused him that morning to risk a long shot at this outlaw, wounding him. Juan Leal and Enrique Lopez, who were there, had both tried their marksmanship and their ropes on him in vain. Dragging down horses and snapping ropes, the bull made his escape into a chaparral thicket. He must have been exceedingly nimble, for I have seen Uncle Lance kill a running deer at a hundred yards with a rifle. At any rate, the entire squad turned out after dinner to renew the attack. We saddled the best horses in our remuda for the occasion, and sallied forth to the lair of the Ladino bull like a procession of professional bullfighters. The chaparral thicket in which the outlaw had taken refuge lay about a mile and a half back from the river, and contained about two acres. On reaching the edge of the thicket, Uncle Lance called for volunteers to beat the brush and rout out the bull. As this must be done on foot, responses were not numerous, but our employer relieved the embarrassment by assigning vaqueros to the duty, also directing Enrique to take one point of the thicket and me the other, with instructions to use our ropes should the outlaw quit the thicket for the river. Detailing Tribucio, who was with us that afternoon, to assist him in leading the loose saddle horses, he divided the six other men into two squads under Theodore Quayle and Dan Happersat. When all was ready, Enrique and myself took up our positions, hiding in the outlying mesquite brush, leaving the loose horse under saddle in the cover at a distance. The thicket was oval in form. Lying with a point towards the river, and we all felt confident if the bull were started, he would make for the timber on the river. With a whoop and a hurrah, and a free discharge of firearms, the beaters entered the chaparral. From my position I could see Enrique lying along the neck of his horse about fifty yards distant, and I had fully made up my mind to give that bucolic vaquero the first chance. During the past two weeks my enthusiasm for roping stray bulls had undergone a change. I was now quite willing that all honors of the afternoon should fall to Enrique. The beaters approached without giving any warning that the bull had been sighted, and so great was the strain and tension 
that I could feel the beating of my horse's heart beneath me. The suspense was finally broken by one or two shots in rapid succession, and as the sound died away, the voice of Juan Leal rang out distinctly, Cidado, poor el toro! And the next moment there was a crackling of brush and a pale dun bull broke cover. For a moment he halted on the border of the thicket, then, as the din of the beaters increased, struck boldly across the prairie for the river. Enrique and I were after him without loss of time. Enrique made a successful cast for his horns, and reined in his horse, but when the slack of the rope was taken up, the rear cinch broke, the saddle was jerked forward on the horse's withers, and Enrique was compelled to free the rope or have his horse dragged down. I saw the mishap, and giving my horse the rowel, rode at the bull and threw my rope. The loop neatly encircled his front feet, and when the shot came between horse and bull, it fetched the toro a somersault in the air, but unhappily took off the pommel of my saddle. The bull was on his feet in a jiffy, and before I could recover my rope, Enrique, who had reset his saddle, passed me followed by the entire squad. Uncle Lance had been a witness to both mishaps, and on overtaking us, urged me to tie on to the bull again. For answer, I could only point to my missing pommel. But every man in the squad had loosened his rope, and it looked as if they would all fasten on to the ladino, for they were all good ropers. Man after man threw his loop on him, but the dun outlaw snapped the ropes as if they had been cotton strings, dragging down two horses with their riders and leaving them in the rear. I rode up alongside Enrique and offering him my rope, but he refused it. Knowing it would be useless to try again with only a single cinch on his saddle, the young rascal had a daring idea in mind. We were within a quarter of a mile of the river, and escape of the outlaw seemed probable when Enrique rode down on the bull, took up his tail, and wrapping the brush on the pommel of his saddle, turned his horse abruptly to the left, rolling the bull over like a hoop, and of course dismounting himself in the act. Then before the dazed animal could rise, with the agility of a panther, the vaquero sprang aside his loins, and as he floundered, others leaped from their horses. Toro was pinioned and dispatched with a shot. Then we loosened the cinches to allow our heaving horses to breathe, and threw ourselves on the ground for a moment's rest. "'That's the best kill we'll make on this trip,' said Uncle Lance, as we mounted, leaving two vaqueros to take the hide. I despise wild cattle, and I've been hungering to get a shot at that fellow for the last three years. Enrique, the day the baby is born, I'll buy it a new cradle, and Tom shall have a new saddle, and we'll charge it to Las Palomas. She's the girl that pays the bills. Scarcely a day passed, but similar experiences were related around the campfire. In fact, as the end of the work came in view, they became commonplace with us. Finally, the two outfits were united at the general hide yard near the home ranch. Coils of small rope were brought from headquarters and a detail of men remained in camp bailing the flint hides, while the remainder scoured the immediate country. A crude press was arranged, and by the aid of a long lever the hides were compressed in the convenient space for handling by the freighters. When we had nearly finished the killing and bailing, an unlooked-for incident occurred. While Deweese was working down near Shepherd's Ferry, report of our work circulated around the country, and his camp had been frequently visited by cattlemen. Having nothing to conceal, he had showed his list of outside brands killed, which was perfectly satisfactory in most instances. As was customary in selling cattle, we expected to make a report of every outside hide taken and settle for them, deducting the necessary expense. But in every community there are those who oppose prevailing customs, and some who can always see sinister motives. One forenoon, when the belling was nearly finished, 
a delegation of men representing the brands of the Frio and San Miguel rode up to our hide yard. They were all well known cowmen, and Uncle Lance, being present, saluted them in his usual hearty manner. In response to an inquiry, what he thought he was doing, Uncle Lamp jocularly replied, Well, you see, you fellows allow your old bulls to drift down on my range, expecting Las Palomas to pension them the remainder of their days. But that's where you get fooled. Ten cents a pound for flint hides beats letting these old staggers die of old age. And this being an idle season with nothing much to do, we wanted to have a little fun, and we've had it. But laying all jokes aside, fellows, it's a good idea to get rid of these old varmints. Hereafter I'm going to make a killing off every two or three years. The boys have kept a list of all stray brands killed, and you can look them over and see how many of yours we got. We have bailed all the stray hides separate, so they can be looked over. But it's nearly noon, and you'd better all ride up to the ranch for dinner. They feed better up there than we do in camp. Rather than make a three-mile ride to the house, the visitors took dinner with the wagon. At about one o'clock, Deweese and a vaquero came in, dragging a hide between them. June cordially greeted the callers, including Henry Anier, who represented the Las Norias Ranch, though I suppose it was well known to everyone present that there was no love lost between them. Uncle Lance asked our foreman for his list of outside brands, explaining that these men wished to look them over. Everything seemed perfectly satisfactory to all parties concerned, and after remaining in camp over an hour, the Weese and the Vaquero saddled fresh horses and rode away. The visitors seemed in no hurry to go, so Uncle Lance sat around camp entertaining them, while the rest of us proceeded with our work of bailing. Before leaving, however, the entire party, in company of our employer, took a stroll about the hide yard, which was some distance from camp. During this tour of an inspection, Anir asked which were the bales of outside hides taken in the Weese's division, claiming he represented a number of brands outside of Las Norias. The bales were pointed out, and some dozen unbaled hides looked over. On account, the baled and unbaled hides were found to tally exactly with the list submitted. But unfortunately, Anir took occasion to insinuate that the list of brands rendered had been doctored. Uncle Lance paid little attention, though he heard, but the other visitors remonstrated with Anir. This only seemed to make him more contentious. Finally, matters came to an open rupture when Anir demanded the cordage be cut on certain bales to allow him to inspect them. Possibly he was within his rights, but on the Nueces during the seventies, to question a man's word was equivalent to calling him a liar, and liar was a fighting word all over the cattle range. Well, Henry, said Uncle Lance rather firmly, if you are not satisfied, I suppose I'll have to open the bales for you. But before I do, I'm going to send after June. Neither you nor anyone else can cast any reflection on a man in my employ. No unjust act can be charged in my presence against an absent man. The vaqueros tell me that my foreman is only around the bend of the river, and I am going to ask all you gentlemen to remain until I can send for him. John Cotton was dispatched after Deweese. Conversation, meanwhile, became polite and changed to other subjects. Those of us at work bailing hides went ahead as if nothing unusual was on the tapas. The visitors were all armed, which was nothing unusual, for the wearing of six-shooters was as common as the wearing of boots. During the interim, several level-headed visitors took Henry Anir to one side, evidently to reason with him, and urge an apology, for they could readily see that Uncle Lance was justly offended. But it seemed that Anir would listen to no one, and while they were yet conversing among themselves, John Cotton and our foreman galloped around the bend of the river and rode up to the yard. 
No doubt Cotton had explained the situation, but as they dismounted, Uncle Lance stepped between his foreman and Anir, saying, "'June, Henry, here, questions the honesty of your list of strays killed, and insists on our cutting the bales for his inspection.' Turning to Anir, Uncle Lance inquired, "'Do you still insist on opening the bales?' "'Yes, sir, I do.' Do we step to one side of his employer, saying to Anir, "'You offer to cut a bale here today, and I'll cut your heart out. Behind my back, you question my word. Question it to my face, you dirty sneak.' Anir sprang backward and to one side, drawing a six-shooter in the movement, while June was equally active. Like a flash, two shots rang out, following the reports, Henry turned halfway round, while Dewey staggered a step backward. Taking advantage of the instant, Uncle Lance sprang like a panther on the June and bore him to the ground, while the visitors fell on a near and disarmed him in a flash. They were dragged struggling farther apart, and after some semblance of sanity had returned, we stripped our foreman and found an ugly flesh wound across his side under the armpit the bullet having been deflected by a rib. Anir had fared worse, and was spitting blood freely, and the mark of exit and entrance of the bullet indicated that the point of one lung had been slightly chipped. I suppose this outcome is what you might call the amende honorable, smiling, said George Nathan, one of the visitors, later to Uncle Lance. I always knew that there was a little bad blood existing between the boys, but I had no idea that it would flash in the pan so suddenly, or I'd have stayed at home. Shooting always lets me out. But the question now is, how are we going to get our man home? Uncle Lance at once offered them horses and a wagon, in case a near would not go into Las Palomas. This he objected to, so a wagon was fitted up and promising to return it the next day, our visitors departed with the best of feelings, save between the two belligerents. We sent June into the ranch and a man to Oakville after a surgeon, and resumed our work in the hide yard as if nothing had happened. Somewhere I have seen the statement that the climate of California was especially conducive to the healing of gunshot wounds. The same claim might be made in behalf of the Nueces Valley. For within a month, both the combatants were again in their saddles. Within a week after this incident, we concluded our work, and the hides were ready for the freighters. We had spent over a month, and had taken fully seven hundred hides, many of which, when dry, would weigh one hundred pounds, the total having a value between five and six thousand dollars. Like their predecessors, the buffalo, the remains of the Ladinos were left to enrich the soil, but there was no danger of the extinction of the species, for at Las Palomas it was the custom to allow every tenth male calf to grow up a bull. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Two Years' Drought The spring of 78 was an early one, but the drought continued, and after the hide hunting was over, we rode our range almost night and day. Thousands of cattle had drifted down from the Frio River country, which sections were suffering from drought as badly as the Nueces. The new wells were furnishing a limited supply of water but we rigged pulleys on the best of them, and when the wind failed, we had recourse to buckets and a rope worked from the pommel of a saddle. A breeze usually arose about ten in the morning and fell about midnight. During the lull, the buckets rose and fell incessantly at eight wells, with no lack of suffering cattle in attendance to consume it as fast as it was hoisted. Many thirsty animals gorged themselves and died in sight of the well, weak ones being frequently trampled to death by the stronger, while flint hides were corded at every watering point. The river had quit flowing, 
and with the first warmth of spring the pools became rancid and stagnant. In sandy and sub-irrigated sections, under a March sun, the grass made a sickly effort to spring, but it lacked substance, and so far from furnishing food for the cattle, it only weakened them. This was my first experience with a serious drought. Uncle Lance, however, met the emergency as though it were part of the day's work, riding continually with the rest of us. During the latter part of March, Aaron Scales, two vaqueros, and myself came in one night from the Ganso and announced not over a month's supply of water in that creek. We also reported to our employer that during our two days' ride, we had skinned some ten cattle, four of which were in our own brand. "'That's not as bad as it might be,' said the old ranchero, philosophically. "'You see, boys, I've been through three droughts since I began ranching on this river. The second one in '51 was the worst. Cattle skulls were as thick along the Nueces that year as sunflowers in August. In '66 it was nearly as bad, there being more cattle, but it didn't hurt me very much, as Maverickine had been good for some time before and for several years following, and I soon recovered my losses. The first one lasted three years, and had there been as many cattle as they are now, half of them would have died. The spring before the second drought, I acted as padrino for Tribucio and his wife, who was at that time a mere slip of a girl living at the mission. Before they had time to get married, the dry spell set in, and they put the wedding off until it should rain. I ridiculed the idea, but they were both superstitious and stuck it out. And honest, boys, there wasn't enough rain fell in two years to wet your shirt. In my forty years on the oasis, I've seen hard times, but that drought was the toughest of them all. Game and birds left the country, and the cattle were too poor to eat. Whenever our provisions ran low, I sent Tribuzio to the coast with a load of hides, using six yoke of oxen to handle the cargo of about a ton. The oxen were so poor that they had to stand twice in one place to make a shadow, and we wouldn't take gold for our flint hides, but insisted on the staples of life. At one point on the road, Tribuzio had to give a quart of flour for watering his team, both going and coming. They said that when the Jews quit a country, it's time for the Gentiles to leave. But we old-timers are just like a horse that chooses a new range, and will stay with it until he starves or dies with old age. I could see nothing reassuring in the outlook. Near the wells and along the river, the stock had trampled out the grass until the ground was as bare as a city street. Miles distance from the water, the old dry grasses, with only occasional green blade, was the only grazing for the cattle. The black, waxy soil on the first bottom of the river, on which the mesquite grass had flourished, was as bare now as a plowed field, while the ground had cracked open in places to an incredible depth, so that without exercising caution it was dangerous to ride across. This was the condition of the range at the approach of April. Our horse stock, to be sure, fared better, ranging farther and not requiring anything like the amount of water needed by the cattle. It was nothing unusual to meet a Las Palomas manada from ten to twelve miles from the river, and coming in only every second or third night to quench their thirst. We were fortunate in having an abundance of saddle horses, which, whether under saddle or not, were always given the preference in the matter of water. They were the motive power of the ranch, and during this crisis, though worked hard, must be favored in every possible manner. Early that spring, the old ranchero sent Deweese to Lagarto in an attempt to sell Captain Byler a herd of stock horses for the trail. The mission was a failure, though our segundo offered to sell a thousand in the straight Las Palomas brand at seven dollars a head on a year's credit. Even this was no inducement to the trail drover, and on Deweese's return, 
My employer tried San Antonio and other points in Texas, in the hope of finding a market. From several places favorable replies were received, particularly from places north of the Colorado River, for the drought was local and was chiefly confined to the southern portion of the state. There was enough encouragement in the letter to justify the old ranchero's attempt to reduce the demand on the ranch's water supply by sending a herd of horse stock north on sale. Under ordinary conditions, every ranchman preferred to sell his surplus stock at the ranch, and Las Palomas was no exception, being generally congested with marketable animals. San Antonio was, however, beginning to be a local horse and mule market of some moment, and before my advent several small selected bunches of mares and mules and saddle horses had been sent there and had found a ready and profitable sale. But this was an emergency year, and it was decided to send a herd of stock horses up the country. Accordingly, before April, we worked every manada which we expected to keep, cutting out all the two-year-old fillies. To these were added every mongrel-colored band to the number of twenty-odd, and when ready to start, the herd numbered a few over twelve hundred of all ages from yearlings up. A remuda of fifty saddle horses, broken in the spring of seventy-six, were allotted to our use, and our segundo, myself, and five Mexican vaqueros were detailed to drive the herd. We were allowed two pack mules for our commissary, which was driven with the remuda, with instructions to sell and hurry home. We left our horse camp on the river, and started on the morning of the last day of March. Livestock commission firms in San Antonio were notified of our coming, and with six men to the herd, and the seventh driving the remuda, we put twenty miles behind us the first day. With the exception of water for saddle stock, which we hoisted from a well, there was no hope of watering the herd before reaching Mr. Booth's ranch on the Frio. He had been husbanding his water supply and early the second evening we watered the herd to its contentment from a single shaded pool. From the Frio we could not follow any road, but were compelled to direct our course wherever there was a prospect of water. By hobbling the bell mare of the Remuda at evening, and making two watches of the night herding, we easily systemized our work, until we reached the San Antonio River about twenty miles below the city, not over two days passed without water for all the stock, though, on account of the variation from our course, we were over a week in reaching San Antonio. Having moved the herd up near some old missions within five or six miles of the city, with an abundance of water and some grass, Deweese went into town, visiting the commission firms and looking for a buyer, fortunately a firm which was expecting our arrival, had a prospective purchaser from Fort Worth for about our number. Making a date with the firm to show our horses the next morning, our segundo returned to the herd, elated over the prospect of a sale. On their arrival the next morning, we had the horses already watered and were grazing them along an abrupt slope between the first and second bottoms of the river. The salesman understood his business and drove the conveyance back and forth on the downhill side below the herd, and the rise in the ground made our range stock look as big as American horses. After looking at the animals for an hour from a buckboard, the prospective buyer insisted on looking at the remuda. But as these were gentle, he gave them a more critical examination, insisting on their being penned in a rope corral at our temporary camp and had every horse that was then being ridden, unsaddled, to inspect their backs. The remuda was young, gentle, and sound, many of them submitting to be caught without a rope. The buyer was pleased with them, and when the price came up for discussion, Deweese artfully set a high figure on the saddle stock, and, to make his bluff good, offered to reserve them and take them back to the ranch. But Tuttle would not consider the herd without the remuda, and sparring between them continued until all three returned to town. 
It was a day of expectancy to the vaqueros and myself. In examining the saddle horses, the buyer acted like a cowman. But as regarding the range stock, it was evident to me that his armor was vulnerable, and if he got any of the best of our segundo, he was welcome to it. Deweese returned shortly after dark, coming directly to the herd where I and two vaqueros were on guard, to inform us that he had sold lock, stock, and barrel, including the two pack mules. I felt like shouting over the good news, when June threw a damper on my enthusiasm by the news that he had sold for delivery at Fort Worth. You see, said Deweese, by way of explanation, the buyer is foreman of a cattle company out on the forks of the Brazos in Young County. He doesn't sabe range horses as well as he does cows. And when he had agreed on the saddle stock, and there were only two bits between us on the herd, he offered me six bits a head all round, over and above his offer, if I would put them in Fort Worth. And I took him up so quick that I nearly bit my tongue doing it. Captain Redmond tells me that it is only about three hundred miles, and grass and water is reported good. I intended to take him up at his offer anyhow, and seventy-five cents a head extra will make the old man nearly a thousand dollars, which is worth picking up. We'll put them there easy in three weeks, learn the trail, and see the country besides. Uncle Lance can't have any kick coming, for I offered them to Captain Byler for seven dollars, and here I'm getting ten six bits, nearly four thousand dollars advance, and we won't be gone five weeks. Any money down? Well, I should remark, five thousand deposited with Smith and Redmond, and I was particular to have it inserted in the contract between us that every saddle horse, mare, mule, gelding, and filly was to be in the straight horse-hoof brand. There's a possibility that when Tuttle sees them again at Fort Worth, they won't look as large as they did on that hillside this morning. We made an early start from San Antonio the next morning, passing to the westward of the then straggling city. The vaqueros were disturbed over the journey, for Fort Worth was as foreign to them as a European seaport, but I jollied them into believing it was but a little posseer. Though I had never ridden on a train myself, I pictured to them the luxuriant ease with which we would return, as well as the trip by stage to Oakville. I threw enough enthusiasm into my description of the good time we were going to have, coupled with their confidence in Deweese, to convince them, in spite of their forebodings. Our segundo humored them in various ways, and after a week on the trail, water getting plentiful, Using two guards, we only heard it until midnight, turning the herd loose from then until daybreak. It usually took us less than an hour to gather and count them in the morning, and encouraged by their contentment, a few days later, we loose herded until darkness and then turned them free. From then on, it was a picnic as far as work was concerned, and our saddle horses and herd improved every day. After crossing the Colorado River at every available chance en route, we mailed a letter to the buyer, notifying him of our progress as we swept northward. When within a day's drive of the Brazos, we mailed our last letter, giving notice that we would deliver within three days of date. On reaching that river, we found it swimming for between thirty and forty yards. But by tying up the pack mules and cutting the herd into four bunches, we swam the Brazos with less than an hour's delay, overhauling and transferring the packs to horses, throwing away everything but the barest necessities. We crossed the lightened commissary, the freed mules swimming with the remuda on the morning of the twentieth day out from San Antonio. Our segundo rode in to the fort ahead of the herd. We followed at our regular gait, and near the middle of the forenoon were met by Deweese and Tuttle, who piloted us to a pasture west of the city, where an outfit was encamped to receive the herd. They numbered fifteen men, 
and looked at our insignificant crowd with contempt. But the count which followed showed we had not lost a hoof since we left the Nueces, although for the last ten nights the stock had had the fullest freedom. The receiving outfit looked the brands over carefully. The splendid grass and water of the past two weeks had transformed the famishing herd of a month before, and they were received without a question. Rounding in our remuda for fresh mounts before starting to town, the vaqueros and I did some fancy roping in catching out the horses, partially from sheer lightness of heart and because we were at our journey's end, and partially to show this North Texas outfit that we were like the proverbial singed cat better than we looked. Two of Turtle's men rode into town with us that evening to lead back our mounts, the outfit having come in purposely to receive the horse herd and drive it to their ranch in Young County. While riding in, they thawed nicely toward us, but kept me busy interpreting for them with our Mexicans. Tuttle and Deweese rode together in the lead and on nearing town one of the strangers bantered Pasquale to sell him a nice maguey rope which the vaquero carried. When I interpreted the other's wish to him, Pasquale loosened the lasso and made a present of it to Turtle's men. I had almost as good a rope of the same material, which I presented to the other lad with us, and the drinks we afterwards consumed over this slight testimony of the amicable relations existing between a northern and southern Texas outfit over the delivery and receiving of a horse herd showed no evidence of a drought. The following morning I made inquiry for Frank Nancredi and the drovers who had driven a trail herd of cattle from Las Palomas two seasons before. They were all well known about the fort, but were absent at the time having put up two trail herds that spring in Uvalde County. Deweese did not waste an hour more than was necessary in that town, and while waiting for the banks to open, arranged our transportation to San Antonio. We were all ready to start back before noon. Fort Worth was a frontier town at the time, bustling and alert with livestock interests, but we were anxious to get home and promptly boarded a train for the south. After entering the train, our segundo gave each of the vaqueros and myself some spending money, the greater portion of which went to the butcher for fruits. He was an enterprising fellow and took a marked interest in our comfort and welfare. But on nearing San Antonio after midnight, he attempted to sell us our choice of three books, between the leaves of one which he had placed the five-dollar bill and in another a ten, and offered us our choice for two dollars. And June DeWeese became suddenly interested. Coming over to where we were sitting, he knocked the books on the floor, kicked them under a seat, and threatened to bend a gun over the butcher's head unless he made himself very scarce. Then reminding us that there were tricks in all trades but ours, he kept an eye over us until we reached the city. We were delayed another day in San Antonio, settling with the commission firm and banking the money. The next morning we took stage for Oakville, where we arrived late at night. When a short distance out of San Antonio, I inquired of our driver who would relieve him beyond Pleasanton, and was gratified to hear that his name was not Jack Martin. Not that I had anything particular against Martin, but I had no love for his wife and had no desire to press the acquaintance any further with her or her husband. On reaching Oakville, we were within forty miles of Las Palomas. We had our saddles with us, and early the next morning tried to hire horses, but as the stage company domineered the village, we were unable to hire saddle stock, and on appealing to the only livery in town, we were informed that Bethel and Oxenford had the first claim on their conveyances. Accordingly, DeWeese and I visited the offices of the stage company, where, to our surprise, we came face to face with Jack Oxenford. I do not think he knew us, 
though we both knew him at a glance. Deweese made known his wants, but only asked for a conveyance as far as Shepherd's. Yankee-like, Oxenford had to know who we were, where we had been, and where we were going. Our segundo gave him rather a short answer, but finally admitted that we belonged at Las Palomas. Then the junior member of the mail contractors became arrogant, claiming that the only conveyance capable of carrying our party was being held for a sheriff with some witnesses. On second thought, he offered to send us to the ferry by two lighter vehicles in consideration of five dollars apiece, insolently remarking that we could either pay it or walk. I will not repeat Deweese's reply, which I silently endorsed. With the soil of the Nueces Valley once more under our feet, we felt independent. On returning to the Vaqueros, we found a stranger among them. Burnaby Cruz, by name, who was a muy amigo of Santiago Ortiz, one of our Mexicans. He belonged at the mission, and when he learned of our predicament, offered to lend us his horse, and as he expected to be in town for a few days. The offer was gratefully accepted, and within a quarter of an hour, Manuel Flores had started for Shepherd's with an order to the merchant to send in several horses for us. It was less than two hours' ride to the ferry, and with the early start we expected Manuel to return before noon. Making ourselves at home in a coffee house conducted by a Mexican, Deweese ordered a few bottles of wine to celebrate properly our drive and to entertain crews in our vaqueros. Before the horses arrived, those of us who had any money left spent it in the cantina not wishing to carry it home where it would be useless. The result was that on the return of Flores with mounts, we were all about three sheets in the wind, reckless and defiant. After saddling up, I suggested to June that we ride by the stage office and show Mr. Oxenford that we were independent of him. The stage stand and office were on the outskirts of the scattered village, and while we could have avoided it, our segundo willingly led the way, and called for the junior member of the firm. A hostler came to the door and informed us that Mr. Oxenford was not in. "'Then I'll just leave my card,' said Deweese, dismounting. Taking a brown cigarette paper from his pocket, he wrote his name on it, then pulling a tack from a notice pasted beside the office door, he drew a six-shooter and with it deftly tacked the cigarette paper against the office door jam. Remounting his horse and perfectly conscious that Oxenford was within hearing, he remarked to the hostler, When your boss returns, please tell him that those fellows from Las Palomas will neither walk with him nor ride with him. We thought he might fret as to how we were to get home, and we just have ridden by to tell him that he need feel no uneasiness. Since I have never had the pleasure of an introduction to him, I put my name on that cigarette paper. Good day, sir. Arriving at Shepherd's, we rested several hours, and on the suggestion of the merchant, changed horses before starting home. At the ferry, we learned that there had been no serious loss of cattle so far, but that nearly all the stock from the Frio and San Miguel had drifted across to the Nueces. We also learned that the attendance on San Jacinto Day had been extremely light, not a person from Las Palomas being present, while the tournament for that year had been abandoned. During our ride up the river before darkness fell, we passed a strange medley of brands, many of which Deweese assured me were owned from fifty to a hundred miles to the north and west. Riding leisurely, it was nearly midnight when we sighted the ranch and found it astir. An extra breeze had been blowing, and the vaqueros were starting to their work at the wells in order to be on hand the moment the wind slackened. Around the two wells at the headquarters were over a thousand cattle, whose constant moaning reached our ears over a mile from the ranch. Our return was like entering a house of mourning. Miss Jean, 
barely greeted Deweese and myself, while Uncle Lance paced the gallery without making a single inquiry as to what had become of the horse herd. On the mistress's orders, servants set out a cold luncheon and disappeared, as if in the presence of death without a word of greeting. Ever thoughtful, Miss Jean added several little delicacies to our plain meal, and seating herself at the table with us, gave us a clear outline of the situation. In seventy-odd miles of the meanderings of the river across our range, there was not a pool to the mile with water enough for a hundred cattle. The wells were gradually becoming weaker, yielding less water every week. While of four new ones which were commenced before our departure, two were dry and worthless. The vaqueros were then skinning on an average forty dead cattle a day, fully half of which were in the Las Palomas brand. Sympathetically, as a sister could, she accounted for her brother's lack of interest in our return by his anxiety and years, and she cautioned us to let no evil report reach his ears, as this drought had unnerved him. Deweese at once resumed his position on the ranch, and the next morning the ranchero held a short council with him, authorizing him to spare no expense to save the cattle. Deweese returned the borrowed horses by Enrique, and sent a letter to the merchant at the ferry directing him to secure and send at least twenty men to Las Palomas. The first day after our return, we rode the mills and the river. Convinced that the sink other wells on the mesa would be fruitless, the foreman decided to dig a number of shallow ones in the bed of the river, in hopes of catching seepage water. Accordingly, the next morning I was sent with a commissary wagon and seven men to the mouth of the Gonzo, with instructions to begin sinking wells about two miles apart. Taking with us such tools as we needed, we commenced our first well at the confluence of the Ganso with the Nueces, and a second one above. From timber along the river, we cut the necessary temporary curbing, and put it in place as the wells were sunk. On the third day, both wells became so wet as to impede our work, and on our foreman's riding by, he ordered them curbed to the bottom, and a tripod set up over them, on which to rig a rope and pulley. The next morning, troughs and rigging, with a remuda of horses and a watering crew of four strange vaqueros, arrived. The wells were only about twenty feet deep, but by drawing water as fast as the seepage accumulated, each was capable of watering several hundred head of cattle daily. By this time, the Weiss had secured ample help and started a second crew of well-diggers opposite the ranch, who worked down the river, while my crew followed some fifteen miles above. By the end of the month of May, we had some twenty temporary wells in operation, and these, in addition to the water the pools afforded, relieved the situation to some extent, though the ravages of death by thirst went on apace among the weaker cattle. With the beginning of June, we were operating nearly thirty wells. In some cases, two vaqueros could hoist all the water that accumulated in three wells. We had a string of camps along the river, and at every windmill on the mesa, men were stationed night and day. Among the cattle, the death rate was increasing all over the range. Frequently, we took over a hundred skins in a single day, while at every camp, Cords of falling flint hides were accumulating. The heat of summer was upon us. The wind arose daily, sandstorms and dust clouds swept across the country, until our once prosperous range looked like a desert, withered and accursed. Young cows forsook their offspring in the hour of their birth. Motherless calves wandered about the range, hollow-eyed, their piteous appeals unheeded until some lurking wolf sucked their blood and spread a feast to the vultures, constantly wheeling in great flights overhead. Prickly pear, an extremely arid plant, 
affording both food and drink to herds during the drought, had turned white, blistered by the torrid sun until it had fallen down lifeless. The chaparral was destitute of foliage, and on the divides and higher mesas had died. The native women stripped their wakals of every sacred picture and hung them on the withered trees about their doors, where they hourly prayed to their patron saints. In the humblest homes on Las Palomas, candles burned both night and day to appease the frowning deity. The white element on the ranch worked almost unceasingly, stirring the Mexicans to the greatest effort. The middle of June passed without a drop of rain, but on the morning of the 20th, after working all night, as Pascal Arispe and I were drawing water from a well on the border of the Encinal, I felt a breeze spring up that started the windmill. Casting my eyes upward, I noticed that the wind had veered to a quarter directly opposite to that of the customary coast breeze. Not being able to read or write the portent of the change in the wind, I had to learn from that native-born son of the soil. Thomas, he cried, riding up excitedly, in three days it will rain. Listen to me. Pascual Arispe says that in three days the arroyos on the hacienda of Don Lancelot will run like a mill race. See, si, compañero, the wind has changed. The breeze is from the northwest this morning. Before three days it will rain. Madre de Dios. The wind from the northwest continued steadily for two days, relieving us from work. On the morning of the third day, the signs in the sky and air were plain for falling weather. Cattle, tottering with weakness, came into the well, and after drinking, playfully kicked up their heels on leaving. Before noon, the storm struck us like a cloudburst. Pascal and I took refuge under the wagon to avoid the hailstones. In spite of the parched ground, drinking to its contentment, water flooded under the wagon, driving us out. But we laughed at the violence of the deluge. And after making everything secure, saddled our horses and set out for home, taking our relay mounts with us. It was fifteen miles to the ranch and in the eye of the storm. But those loose horses faced the rain as if they enjoyed it while those under saddle followed the free ones as a hound does a scent. Within two hours after leaving the well, we reined in at the gate, and I saw Uncle Lance and a number of the boys promenading the gallery. But the old ranchero leisurely walked down the pathway to the gate, and amid the downpour shouted to us, Turn those horses loose. This ranch is going to take a month's holiday. End of chapter 14
lest the downpour might stop, he stood guard, noting every change in the rainfall, barely taking time to eat or catch an hour's sleep. But when the grateful rain had continued until the evening of the second day, assuring a bountiful supply of water all over our range, he joined us at supper, exultant as a youth of twenty. Boys, said he, this has been a grand rain. If our tanks hold, we will be independent for the next eighteen months. If not another drop falls, the river ought to flow for a year. I have seen worse droughts since I lived here. But what hurt us now was the amount of cattle and the heavy drift which flooded down from us from up the river and north on the Frio. The loss is nothing. We won't notice it in another year. I have kept a close tally of the hides taken, and our brand will be short about two thousand, or less than ten percent of our total numbers. They were principally old cows and will not be missed. The calf drop this fall will be short, but taking it up one side and down the other, we got off lucky. The third day after the rain began, the sun rose bright and clear. Not a hoof of cattle or horses was in sight and though it was midsummer the freshness of the earth and air was like that of a spring morning everyone felt like riding while awaiting the arrival of saddle horses the extra help hired during the drought was called in and settled with two brothers fidel and carlos trujillo begged for permanent employment they were promising young fellows born on the aransas river and after consulting with Deweese, Uncle Lance took both into permanent service on the ranch. A room in an outbuilding was allotted to them, and they were instructed to get their meals in the kitchen. The remudas had wandered far, but one was finally brought in by a vaquero, and by pairs we mounted and rode away. On starting, the tanks demanded our first attention, and finding all four of them safe, we threw out of gear all the windmills. Then Theodore Quayle and I were partners during the day's ride to the south, and on coming in at evening fell in with Uncle Lance and our Segundo, who had been as far west as the Ganso. Quayle and I had discussed during the day the prospect of a hunt at the Vox Ranch, and on meeting our employer artfully interested the old ranchero regarding the amount of cat signs seen that day along the arroyo sordo it's hard luck boy said he to find ourselves afoot and the hunting so promising but we haven't a horse on the ranch that could carry a man ten miles in a straightaway dash after the hounds it will be a month yet before the grass has substance enough in it to strengthen our remudas oh if it hadn't been for the condition of saddle stock don pierre would have come right through the rain yesterday but when Las Palomas can't follow the hounds for lack of mounts, you can depend on it that other ranches can't either. It just makes me sick to think of this good hunting. But what can we do for a month but fold our hands and sit down? But if you boys are itching for an excuse to get over on the Frio, why, I'll make you a good one. This drought has knocked all the sociability out of the country. But now the ordeal is past, Theodore is in honor bound to go over to the Vox Ranch. I don't suppose you boys have seen the girls on the Frio and San Miguel in six months. Time? That's about all we have got right now. Time? We've got time to burn. Our feeler had borne fruit. An excuse or permission to go to the Frio was what Quayle and I were after. And though no doubt the old matchmaker was equally anxious to have us go, in expressing our thanks for the promised vacation, we included several provisos, in case there was nothing to do, or if we concluded to go, when Uncle Lance turned in his saddle and gave us a withering look. I've often wondered, he said, if the blood in your fellows is really red, or if it's white like a fish's. Now, when I was your age, I had to steal chances to go see my girl, but I never gave her any show to forget me and worried her to a fare ye well. And if my observations and years go for anything, that's just the way girls like to have a fellow act. Of course they'll bluff, and let on they must be wooed, and all that. 
just like Francis did at the tournament a year ago. I contend that with a clear field, the only way to make any progress in sparking a girl is to get one arm around her waist and with the other hand keep her from scratching you. That's the very way they like to be courted. Theodore and I dropped behind after this lecture, and before we reached the ranch had agreed to ride over to the Frio the next morning. During our absence that day, there had arrived at Las Palomas from the mission a padrino in the person of Don Alejandro Trevino. Juana Leal, only daughter of Tribucio, had been sought in marriage by a nephew of Don Alejandro, and the latter, dignified as a Castilian noble, was then at the house negotiating for the girl's hand. Juana was nearly eighteen, had been born at the ranch, and after reaching years of usefulness, had been adopted into Miss Jean's household. To ask for her hand required audacity. For the master and mistress of Las Palomas, it was like asking for a daughter of the house. Miss Jean was agitated and all in a flutter. Tribucio and his wife were struck dumb, for Juana was the baby and only unmarried one of their children. And to take her from Las Palomas, they could never consent to that. But Uncle Lance had gone through such experiences before, and met the emergency with promptness. "'That's all right, little sister,' said the old matchmaker to Miss Jean, who had come out to the gate where we were unsaddling. "'Don't you borrow any trouble in this matter. Leave things to me. I've handled trifles like this among these natives for nearly forty years now, and I don't see any occasion to try and make out a funeral right after the drought's been broken by a fine rain. Shucks, girl, this is time for rejoicing.' You go back in the house and entertain Don Alejandro with your best smiles till I come in. I want to have a talk with Tribucio and his wife before I meet the padrino. There are several families of those Trevinos over around the mission, and I want to locate which tribe this Oso comes from. Some of them are good people, and some of them need a rope around their necks. And in a case of keeps like getting married, it's always the safe to know what's what and who's who. Now, sis, go on back in the house and entertain the dawn. Come with me, Tom. I saw our plans for the morrow vanish in the thin air. On arriving at the Wakao, we were admitted. But a gloom like the pall of death seemed to envelop the old Mexican couple. When we had taken seats around the small table, Tia Inez handed the ranchero the formal written request. As it was penned in Spanish, it was passed to me to read, and after running through it hastily, I read it aloud, several times stopping to interpret to Uncle Lance certain extravagant phrases. The salutary was in the usual form. The esteem with which each family had always entertained for the other was dwelt upon at length, and choicer language was never used than the Petrino penned in asking for the hand of Donna Juana. This dainty missive was signed by the godfather of the swain, Don Alejandro Trevino, whose rubric riotously ran back and forth entirely across the delicate tinted sheet. On the conclusion of the reading, Uncle Lance brushed the letter aside as of no moment, and, turning to the old couple, demanded to know to which branch of the Trevino family young Don Blas belonged. The account of Tribucio and his wife was definite and clear. The father of the swain conducted a small country store at the mission, and besides, had landed and cattle interests. He was a younger brother of Don Alejandro, who was the owner of a large land grant, had cattle in abundance, and was a representative man among the Spanish element. No better credentials could have been asked, but when their patron railed them, as to the cause of their gloom, Tia Inez burst into tears, admitting the match was satisfactory, but her baby would be carried away from Las Palomas, and she might never see her again. Her two sons, who lived at the ranch, allowed no day to pass without coming to see their mother, and the one who lived at a distant ranchita came at every opportunity. 
But if her little girl was carried away to a distant ranch, ah, that made it impossible. Let Don Lance, worthy patron of his people, forbid the match, and win the gratitude of an anguished mother. Invoking the saints to guide her aright, Don Inez threw herself on the bed in hysterical lamentation. Realizing it is useless to argue with a woman in tears, the old matchmaker suggested to Trebusio that we delay the answer the customary fortnight. Promising to do nothing further without consulting them, we withdrew from the Wacow. On returning to the house, we found Miss Jean entertaining the Don to the best of her ability, and commanding my presence, the old matchmaker advanced to meet the padrino, with whom he had a slight acquaintance. Bidding his guest welcome to the ranch, he listened to the Don's apology for being such a stranger to Las Palomas until a matter of a delicate nature had brought him hither. Don Alejandro was a distinguished-looking man, and spoke his native tongue in a manner which put my efforts as an interpreter to shame. The conversation was allowed to drift at will, from the damages of the recent drought to the prospect of a market for beeves that fall, until supper was announced. After the evening repast was over, we retired to the gallery, and Uncle Lance reopened the matchmaking by inquiring of Don Alejandro if his nephew proposed taking his bride to the mission. The Don was all attention. Fortunately, anticipating that the question might arise, he had discussed that very feature with his nephew. At present the young man was assisting his father at the mission, and in no time, no doubt, would succeed to the business. However, realizing that her living fifty miles distance might be an objection to the girl's parents, he was not for insisting on that point, as no doubt Las Palomas offered equally good advantages for business. He simply mentioned this by way of suggestion, and invited the opinion of his host. "'Well now, Don Alejandro," said the old matchmaker, in flute-like tones, we are very simple people here at Las Palomas, breeding a few horses and mules for home purposes, and the rearing of cattle has been our occupation. As to merchandising here at the ranch, I could not countenance it, as I refused that privilege to the stage company when they offered to run past Las Palomas. At present our few wants are supplied by a merchant at Shepherd's Ferry. True, it's thirty miles, but I sometimes wish it was further as it is quite a temptation to my boys to ride there on various pretexts. We send down every week for our mail and such little necessities as the ranch may need. If there was a store here, it would attract loafers and destroy the peace and contentment which we now enjoy. I would object to it, one man to his trade and another to his merchandise. The padrino, with good diplomacy, heartily agreed, that a store was a disturbing feature on a ranch, and instantly went off on a tangent on the splendid business possibilities of the mission. The matchmaker in return agreed as heartily with him, and grew reminiscent. In the spring of fifty-one, said he, I made the match between Trebusio and Donna Inez, father and mother of Juana. Trebusio was a vaquero of mine at the time. Inez being a mission girl, and I have taken a great interest in the couple ever since. All their children were born here and still live on the ranch. Understand, Don Alejandro, I have no personal feeling in the matter, beyond the wishes of the parents of the girl. My sister has taken a great interest in Joanna, having had the girl under her charge for the past eight years. Of course, I feel a pride in Joanna, and she is a fine girl. If your nephew wins, sir, I shall tell the lucky rascal when he comes to claim her that he has won the pride of Las Palomas. I take it, Don Alejandro, that your visit and request was rather unexpected here, though I am aware that Joanna has visited among cousins at the mission several times the past few years, but that she had lost her heart to some of your young gallants comes as a surprise to me, and from what I learn to her parents also. Under the circumstances, if I were you, I would not urge an immediate reply, but give them the customary period to think it over. 
our vaqueros will not be very busy for some time to come, and it will not inconvenience us to send a reply by messenger to the mission. And tell Don Blas, even should the reply be unfavorable, not to be discouraged. Women you know are peculiar. Ah, Don Alejandro, when you and I were young and went courting, would we have been discouraged by a first refusal? Senor Trevino appreciated the compliment, and, with a genial smile, slapped his host on the back, while the old matchmaker gave vent to a vociferous guffaw. The conversation thereafter took several tacks, but always reverted to the proposed match. As the hour grew late, the host apologized to his guest, as no doubt he was tired by his long ride, and offered to show him to his room. The padrino denied all weariness, maintaining that the enjoyable evening had rested him, but reluctantly allowed himself to be shown to his apartment. No sooner were the good nights spoken than the old ranchero returned, and, snapping his fingers for attention, motioned me to follow. By a circuitous route we reached the Wacal of Trebucio. The old couple had not yet retired, and Juana blushingly admitted us. Uncle Lance jollied the old people like a robust, healthy son amusing his elders. We took seats, as before, around the small table, and Uncle Lance scattered the gloom of the wacal with his gaiety. "'Las Palomas forever,' said he, striking the table with his bony fist. "'This padrino from the mission is a very fine gentleman, but a poor matchmaker. Just because young Don Blas is the son of a Trevino, the keeper of a picayune tienda at the mission, was that any reason to presume for the hand of a daughter of Las Palomas? Was he any better than a vaquero just because he doled out frijoles by the court and never saw a piece of money larger than a media real? Why, a Las Palomas vaquero was a prince compared to a fawning attendant in a mission store. Let Tia Inez stop fretting herself about losing to Juana. It would not be yet a while. Just leave matters to him, and he'd send Don Alejandro home, pleased with his visit, and hopeful over the match, even if it never took place. And none of those frowns from the young lady. As we all arose in parting, the old matchmaker went over to Juana, and, shaking his finger at her, said, Now look here, my little girl, your mistress, your parents, and myself, are all interested in you, and don't think we won't act to your best interests. You've seen this young fellow ride by on a horse several times, haven't you? Danced with him a few times under the eyes of a chaperone, at the last fiesta, haven't you? And that's all you care to know? Are you ready to marry him? Well, well, it's fortunate that the marriage customs of the Mexican protect such innocents as you. Now, if young Don Blas had worked under me for a year as a vaquero, I might be as ready to the match as you are, for then I'd know whether he was worthy of you. What does a girl of your age know about a man? But when you have as many gray hairs in your head as your mother has, you will thank me for cautioning everyone to proceed slowly in this match. Now dry those tears and go to your mother. The next morning, Don Alejandro proposed returning to the mission, but the old ranchero hooted the idea and informed his guest that he had ordered the ambulance, as he intended showing him the recent improvements made on Las Palomas. When the guest protested against a longer absence from home, the host artfully intimated that by remaining another day a favorable reply might possibly go with him. Don Alejandro finally consented. I was pressed in as driver and interpreter, and our team tore away from the ranch with a flourish. To put it mildly, I was disgusted at having my plans for the day knocked in the head, yet knew better than protest. As we drove along, myriads of grass blades were peeping up since the rain, giving every view a greenish cast. Nearly every windmill on the ranch on our circuit was pointed out and we passed three of our four tanks, one of which was over a half mile in length. After stopping at an outlying ranchita for refreshments, we spent the afternoon in a similar manner. 
From a swell of the prairie some ten miles to the westward of the ranch, we could distinctly see an outline of the Ganso. Halting the ambulance, the old ranchero pointed out to his guest the meanderings of that creek from its confluence with the parent stream until it became lost in the hills to the southward. That tract of ground, said he, is my last landed addition to Las Palomas. It lies north and south, giving me six miles frontage on the Nueces, and extending north of the river just about four miles. Don Alejandro, when I note the great change which has come over this valley since I settled here, it convinces me that if one wishes to follow ranching, he'd better acquire title to what range he needs. Land has advanced in price from a few cents an acre to four bits, and now they say the next generation will see it worth a dollar. This Gonzo grant contains a hundred and fourteen sections, and I have my eye on one or two other adjoining tracts. My generation will not need it, but the one who succeeds me may. Now, as we drive home, I'll try to show you the northern boundary of our range. It's fairly well outlined by the divide between the Nueces and the Frio rivers. From the conversation which followed until we reached headquarters, I readily understood that the old matchmaker was showing the rose and concealing its thorn. His motive was not always clear to me, for one would have supposed, from his almost boastful claims regarding its extent and carrying capacity for cattle, he was showing the ranch to a prospective buyer. But as we neared home, the conversation innocently drifted to the Mexican element and their love for the land to which they were born. Then I understood why I was driving four mules instead of basking in the smiles of my own sweetheart on the San Miguel. Nor did this boasting cease during the evening, but alternated from lands and cattle to the native people, and finally centered about a Mexican girl who had been so fortunate as to have been born to the soil of Las Palomas. When Don Alejandro asked for his horse the following morning, on leaving, Uncle Lance, Quayle, and myself formed the guard of honor to escort our guest a distance on his way. He took leave of the mistress of Las Palomas in an obeisance worthy of an old-time cavalier. Once we were off, Uncle Lance pretended to have had final interview with the parents, in which they had insisted on the customary time in which to consider the proposal. The padrino graciously accepted the situation, thanking his host for his interest in behalf of his nephew. On reaching the river where our way separated, all halted for a few minutes at parting. "'Well done, Alejandro,' said the old ranchero. "'This is my limit of escort to guests of the ranch. Now, the only hope I have in parting is, in case the reply should be unfavorable, that Don Blas will not be discouraged, and that we may see you again at Las Palomas. Tender my congratulations to your nephew, and tell him that a welcome always awaits him in case he finds time and inclination to visit us. I take some little interest in matches. These boys of mine are going north to the Frio on a court and errand today but our marriage customs are inferior to yours, and our young people left to themselves don't seem to marry. Don Alejandro, if you and I had the makings of the matches, there'd be a cradle rocking in every wacal. Both smiled, said their adios, amigos, and he was gone. As our guests cantered away down the river road, Quail and I began looking for a ford. The river had been on a rampage, and while we were seeking out a crossing, our employer had time for a few comments. The Don's tickled with his prospects. He thinks he's got half an inch of rope on Joanna right now. But if I thought your prospects were no better than I know his are, you wouldn't tire any horse flesh of mine by riding to the Frio and the San Miguel. But go right on and stay as long as you want to, for I'm in no hurry to see your faces again. Tom, with the ice broken as it is, as soon as Esther can remove her disabilities, well, you won't have to run off the next time. And Theodore, remember what I told you the other day about sparking a girl. You're too timid and backward for a young fellow. 
I don't care if you come home with one eye scratched out, just so you and Francis have come to an understanding and name the day. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Matchmaking. After our return to the Frio, my first duty was writing, relative to the proposed match, an unfavorable reply to Don Alejandro Trevino. On resuming work, we spent six weeks baling hides, thus occupying our time until the beginning of the branding season. A general round-up on the Nueces Valley, commencing on the coast at Corpus Christi Bay, had been agreed upon among the cowmen of the country. In pursuance of the plan, four well-mounted men were sent out from our ranch with Wilson's wagon to the coast. Our segundo, following a week later with the wagon, Remuda, and twelve men, to meet the rodeo at San Patricio as they worked up the river. Our cattle had drifted in every direction during the drought, and though many of them had returned since the range had again become good, they were still widely scattered. So Uncle Lance took the rest of us and started for the Frio, working down that river and along the Nueces, until we met the roundup coming up from below. During this cow hunt, I carried my fiddle with me in the wagon, and at nearly every ranch we passed, we stopped and had a dance. Not over once a week did we send in cattle to the ranch to brand, and on meeting the rodeo from below, Deweese had over three thousand of our cattle. After taking these in and branding the calves, we worked over our home range until near the holidays. On our return to the ranch, we learned that young Blas Trevino, from the mission, had passed Las Palomas some days before. He had stopped in passing, but finding the ranchero absent, pled a matter of business at Santa Maria, promising the call in his return. He was then at the ranch on the Terran Callas, and hourly expecting his reappearance, the women of the household were in an agitated state of mind. Since the formal answer had been sent, no word had come from Don Blass, and a rival had meanwhile sprung up in the person of Fidel Trujillo. Within a month after his employment, I noticed the new vaquero casting shy glances at Tijuana. But until the cow hunt on the Frio, I did not recognize the fine handwriting of the old matchmaker. Though my services were never called for as an interpreter between Uncle Lance and the new man, anyone could see there was an understanding between them. That the old ranchero was pushing Fidel forward was evident during the fall cow hunting, by his sending that Mexican into Las Palomas with every bunch of cattle gathered. That evening Don Blas rode into the ranch, accompanied by Father Norquin. The priest belonged at the mission, and their meeting at Santa Maria might, of course, have been accidental. None of the Padre's parishioners at headquarters were expecting him, however, for several months, and Padres are able, padrinos, sometimes among their own faith, even despotic. Taking account, as it appeared, of the ulterior motive, Uncle Lance welcomed the arrivals with a hearty hospitality, which to a stranger seems so genuine as to dispel any suspicion. Not in many a day had a visitor at Las Palomas received more courteous consideration than did Father Norquin. The choicest mint which grew in the enclosures about the wells was none too good for the juleps which were concocted by Miss Jean. Had the master and mistress of the ranch been communicants of his church, the rosy-cheeked padre could have received no more marked attention. The conversation touched lightly on various topics until Santa Maria Ranch was mentioned, when Uncle Lance asked the padre if Don Mateo had yet built him a chapel. The priest shrugged his shoulders deprecatingly and answered the question with another, when Las Palomas proposed building a place of worship. 
"'Well, father, I'm glad you brought the matter up again,' replied the host. "'That I should have lived here over forty years and never done anything for your church or my people, who belong to your faith, is certainly saying little in my behalf. I never had the matter brought home to me so clearly as during last summer's drought. Do you remember that old maxim regarding when the devil was sick? Well, I was good and sick. And if you had happened in then, and had asked for a chapel, not that I have any confidence in your teaching, you could have got a church with a steeple on it. I was in such sore straits that the women were kept busy making candles, and we burnt them in every wakao until the hour of deliverance. Helping himself from the proffered snuff-box of the padre, the host turned to his guest, and in all sincerity continued, Yes, father, who ought to build you a nice place of worship. We could quarry the rock during idle time, and burn our own lime right here on the ranch. While you are here, give me some plans, and we'll show you that the white element of Las Palomas are not such hopeless heretics as you suppose. Now if we build the chapel, I'm just going to ask one favor in return. I expect to die and be buried on this ranch. You are a younger man by twenty years and will outlive me. And on the day of my burial, I want you to lay aside your creed and preach my funeral in this little chapel which you and I are going to build. I have been a witness to the self-sacrifice of you and other priests ever since I lived here. Father, I like an honest man, and the earnestness of your cloth for the betterment of my people no one can question. And my covenant is that you are to preach a simple sermon, merely commemorating the fact that here lived a man named Lovelace, who died and would be seen among his fellow men no more. These being facts, you can mention them, but beyond that, for fear our faiths might differ, the less said the better. Won't you have another mint julep before supper? No. You will, won't you, Don Blas? That the old ranchero was in earnest about building a chapel on Las Palomas there was no doubt. In fact, the credit should be given to Miss Jean, for she had been urging the matter ever since my coming to the ranch. At headquarters and outlying ranchitas of the land, there were nearly twenty families, or over a hundred persons of all ages. But that the old matchmaker was going to make the most out of his opportunity, by erecting the building at an opportune time, there was not the shadow of a question. The evening passed without mention of the real errand of our guests. The conversation was allowed to wander at will, during which several times it drifted into gentle repartee between host and padre, both artfully avoiding the rock of matchmaking. But the next morning, as if anxious to begin the day's work early, Father Norquin, on arising, inquired for his host, strutted out to the corrals, and on meeting him promptly inquired why, during the previous summer, Don Alejandro Trevino's mission to obtain the hand of Juana Leal had failed. "'That's so,' assented Uncle Lance very affably. Don Alejandro was here as godfather to his nephew. And this young man with you is Don Blas, the bear. Well, why did we waste so much time last night talking about chapels and death when we might have made a match in less time? You priests have everything in your favor as padrinos, but are so slow that a rival might appear and win the girl while you were drumming up your courage. I don't write Spanish myself, but I have boys here on the ranch who do. One of them, if I remember rightly, wrote the answer at the request of Joanna's mother. If my memory hasn't failed me entirely, the parents objected to being separated from their only daughter. You know how that is among your people, and I never like to interfere in family matters. But from what I hear, Don Blass has a rival now. Yes, young Trevino failed to press his suit and a girl will stand for nearly anything but neglect. But that's one thing they won't stand for, not when there's a handsome fellow at hand to play the bear. Then the old lover is easily forgotten for the new, huh, father? Ah, Don Lance, I know your reputation as a matchmaker, replied Father Norquin, in a rich French accent. Report says that had you not had a hand in it, 
the match would have been successful. The supposition is that it only lacked your approval. The daughter of a vaquero refusing a Trevino? Tut, tut, man. A hearty guffaw greeted these aspersions. And so you've heard I was a matchmaker, have you? Of course you believe it, just like any other old granny. Now, of course, when I'm asked by any of my people to act as padrino, I never refuse any more than you do. I've made many a match, and hope to be spared to make several more. But come, they're calling us to breakfast, and after that we'll take a walk over to the ranch burying ground. It's less than a half a mile, in that point of Ensenal yonder. I want to show you what I think would be a nice spot for our chapel. The conversation during breakfast was artfully directed by the host to avoid the dangerous shoals, though the padre constantly kept an eye on Joanna as she passed back and forth. As we arose from the table and were passing to the gallery, Uncle Lance nudged the priest and, poking Don Blass in the ribs, said, Is it Joanna a stunning fine cook? Got up that breakfast herself. There isn't an eighteen-year-old girl in Texas who can make as fine biscuits as she does. But Las Palomas raises just as fine girls as she does horses and cattle. The rascal who gets her for a wife can thank his lucky stars. Don Blas, you ought to have had me for Padrino. Your uncle and the padre here are too pokey. Why, if I was making a match for as fine a girl as Juana is, I'd set the river afire before I'd let an unfavorable answer discourage me. Now the padre and I are going for a short walk, and we'll leave you here at the house to work out your own salvation. Don't pay any attention to the mistress, as I want to tell you right now, if you expect to win Joanna, never depend on old fogey padrinos like your uncle and father Norquin. Do a little hustling for yourself. The old ranchero and the priest were gone nearly an hour, and on their return looked at another sight in the rear of the Mexican quarters. It was a pretty knoll, and as the two joined us, where we were repairing a windmill at the corrals, Father Norquin, in an ecstasy of delight, said, Well, my children, the chapel is assured at Las Palomas. Don Lance wanted to build it over in the Ensenal, with twice as nice a site right here in the rancho. We may need the building for a school some day, and if we should, we don't want it a mile away. The very idea. And the master tells me that a chapel has been the wish of his sister for years. Poor woman, to have such a brother. I must hasten to the house and thank her. No sooner had the padre started than I was called aside by my employer. Tom, said he, you slip around to Tia Inez's wakal and tell her that I'm going to send Father Norquin over to see her. Tell her to stand firm on not letting Joanna leave the ranch for the mission. Tell her that I've promised the padre a chapel for Las Palomas, and rather than miss it, the priest would consign the whole Trevino family to endless perdition. Tell her to laugh at his scoldings and inform him that Joanna can get a husband without going so far, and that you heard me say that I was going to give Fidel, the day he marries her daughter, the same number of heifers, that all her brothers got, impress it on Tia Inez's mind, that it means something to be born to Las Palomas. I set out on my errand, and he hastened away to overtake the padre before the latter reached the house. Tia Inez welcomed me, no doubt anticipating that I was the bearer of some message. When I gave her the message, her eyes beamed with gratitude, and she devoutly crossed her breast invoking the blessing of the saints upon the master. I added a few words of encouragement of my own, that I understood that when we quarried the rock for the chapel, there was to be enough extra cut to build a stone cottage for Joanna and Fidel. This was pure invention on my part, but I felt a very friendly interest in Las Palomas, for I expected to bring my bride to it as soon as possible. Therefore, if I could help the present match forward by the use of a little fiction, why not? Father Norquin's time was limited at Las Palomas, as he was under appointment to return to Santa Maria that evening. Therefore it became an active morning about the ranch. Long before we had finished the repairs on the windmill, a mozo 
from the house, came out to the corrals to say that I was wanted by the master. Returning with the servant, I found Uncle Lance and the mistress of the ranch entertaining their company before a cheerful fire in the sitting room. On my entrance, my employer said, Tom, I have sent for you because I want you to go over with the padre to the jacal of Joanna's parents. Father Norquin here is such an old granny that he believes I interfered, or the reply of last summer would have been favorable. Now, Tom, you're not to open your mouth one way or the other. The padre will state his errand, and the old couple will answer him in your presence. Don Blast will remain here, and whatever the answer is, he and I must abide by it. Really, as I have said, I have no interest in the match, except the welfare of the girl. Go on now, father, and let's see what you can do as a padrino. As we arose to go, Miss Jean interposed and suggested that, out of deference to Father Norquin, the old couple be sent for. But her brother objected. He wanted the parents to make their own answer beneath their own roof, unembarrassed by any influence. As we left the room, the old matchmaker accompanied us as far as the gate, where he halted and said to the padre, Father Norquin, in a case like the present, you will not mind my saying that your wish is not absolute, and I am sending a witness with you to see that you issue no peremptory orders on this ranch. And remember that this old couple have been over thirty years in my employ, and temper your words to them as you would to your own parents, were they living. Joanna was born here, which means a great deal, and with the approval of her parents she'll marry the man of her choice, and no padrino, let him be priest or layman, can crack his whip on the soil of Las Palomas to the contrary. As my guest, you must excuse me for talking so plain, but my people are as dear to me as your church is to you. As my employer turned and leisurely walked back to the house, Father Norquin stood stock still. I was slightly embarrassed myself, but it was easy to see that the Padre's plans had received a severe shock. I made several starts toward the Mexican quarters before the priest shook away his hesitations and joined me. That the old ranchero's words had agitated him was very evident in his voice and manner. Several times he stopped me and demanded explanations. Finally, raising the question of arrival, I told him all I knew about the matter, that Fidel and Uva Caro on the ranch had found favor in Joanna's eyes, that he was a favorite man with master and mistress. But what view the girl's parents took of the matter I was unable to say. This cleared up the situation wonderfully, and the padre brightened as we neared the Wacal. Tribucio was absent, and while awaiting his return, the priest became amiable and delivered a number of messages from friends and relatives at the mission. Tia Inez was somewhat embarrassed at first, but gradually grew composed, and before the return of her husband all three of us were chatting like cronies. On the appearance of Tio Tribucio, coffee was ordered, and the padre told several good stories, over which we all laughed heartily. Cigarettes were next, and in due time, Father Norquin, very good-naturedly, inquired why an unfavorable answer regarding the marriage of their daughter with young Blas Trevino had been returned the previous summer. The old couple looked at each other a moment. When the husband turned in his chair, and with a shrug of his shoulders and a jerk of his head, referred the priest to his wife. Tia Inez met the padre's gaze, and in a clear, concise manner, and in her native tongue, gave her reasons. Father Norquin explained the prominence of the Trevino family, and their disappointment over the refusal, and asked if the decision was final, to which he received an affirmative reply. Instead of showing any displeasure, he rose to take his departure, turning in the doorway to say to the old couple, My children, peace and happiness in this life is a priceless blessing. I should be untrue to my trust did I counsel a marriage that would give a parent a moment of unhappiness. My blessings upon this house and its dwellers, and upon its sons and daughters as they go forth to homes of their own. 
While he lifted his hand in benediction, the old couple and myself bowed our heads for a moment, after which the padre and I passed outside. I was as solemn as an owl, and yet inwardly delighted at the turn of affairs. But Father Norquin had nothing to conceal, while delight was wreathed all over his rosy countenance. Again and again he stopped me to make inquiries about Fidel the new vaquero. That lucky rascal was a good-looking native, a much larger youth than the aspiring Don Blas, and I pictured him to the padre as an Adonis. To the question as if he were in the ranch at present, fortune favored me as Fidel and nearly all the regular vaqueros were cutting timber in the Encinal that day with which to build new corrals at one of the outlying tanks. As he would not return before dark, I knew the Padre was due at Santa Maria that evening. My description of him made Don Blas a mere pygmy in comparison. But we finally reached the house, and on our re-entering the sitting-room, young Trevino very courteously arose and stood until Father Norquist should be seated. But the latter faced his parishioner, saying, "'You young simpleton, why did you drag me up here on a fool's errand? I was led to believe that our generous host was the instigator of the unfavorable answer to your uncle's negotiations last summer. Now I have the same answer repeated from the lips of the girl's parents. Consider the predicament in which you have placed a servant of the church. Every law of hospitality has been outraged through your imbecility. And to complete my humiliation, I have received only kindness on every hand. The chapel which I have desired for years is now a certainty, thanks to the master and mistress of Las Palomas. What apology can I offer for your... Hold on there, father, interrupted Uncle Lance. If you owe this ranch an apology, save your breath for a more important occasion. Don Blas is all right. Any suitor who would not be jealous over a girl like Joanna is not welcome at Las Palomas. Why, when I was his age, I was suspicious of my sweetheart's own father. And you should make allowance for this young man's years and impetuosity. Sit down, father, and let's have a talk about this chapel. That's what interests me most right now. You see, within a few days, my boys will have all the palisades cut for the new corrals, and then we can turn our attention to getting out the rock for the chapel. We have a quarry of nice soft stone all opened up, and I'll put a dozen vaqueros to blocking out the rock in a few days. We always have a big stock of sacawista grass on hand for thatching locales, and plenty of limestone to burn for the lime. Sand in abundance, and all we lack is the masons. You'll have to send them out from the mission, but I'll pay them. Oh, I reckon the good Lord loves Las Palomas, for you see... He's placed everything convenient with which to build the chapel. Father Norquin could not remain seated, but paced the room, enumerating the many little adornments which the Mother Church would be glad to supply. Enthusiastic as a child over a promised toy, no other thought entered the simple Padre's mind until dinner was announced. All during the meal, the object of our guest's mission was entirely lost sight of in contemplation of the coming chapel. The padre seemed as anxious to avoid the subject of matchmaking as his host, while poor Don Blas sat like a willing sacrifice, unable to say a word. I sympathized with him, for I knew what it was to meet disappointment. At the conclusion of the midday repast, Father Norquin flew into a great bustle in preparing to start for Santa Maria and I was dispatched for the horses. Our guest and my employer were waiting at the stile when I led up their mounts, and at the final parting the old matchmaker said to the priest, Now remember, I expect you to have the chapel completed by Easter Sunday, when I want you to come out and spend at least two weeks with us, and see that it is finished to suit you, and arrange for the dedication. Las Palomas will build the chapel, but when our work is done, yours commences. And I want to tell you right now that there's liable to be several weddings in it before the mortar gets good and dry. I have it on pretty good authority that one of my boys and Pierre Vox's eldest girl 
are about ready to have you pronounce them man and wife. No, he's not of any faith, but she's a good Catholic. Now look here, Father Norquin, if I have to proselyte you to my way of thinking, it'll never hurt you any. I was never afraid to do what was right, and when at Las Palomas you needn't be afraid either, even if we have to start a new creed. Well, good-bye to both of you. We had a windmill to repair that afternoon, some five miles from the ranch, so I did not return to the house until evening. But when all gathered around the supper table that night, Uncle Lance was throwing bouquets at himself for the crafty manner in which he had switched the padre from his mission, and yet sent him away delighted. He admitted that he was scared on the appearance of Father Norquin as a padrino, on account of the fact that a priest was usually supreme among his own people, that he had early come to the conclusion, if there was to be any coercion used in this case, he was determined to get in his bluff first. But Miss Jean ridiculed the idea that there was any serious danger. "'Goodness me, Lance,' said she, "'I could have told you there was no cause for alarm. In this case between Fidel and Joanna, I've been a very liberal chaperone. Oh, well, now never mind about the particulars. Once to try his nerve, I gave him a chance, and I happened to know the rascal kissed her the moment my back was turned. Oh, I think Joanna will stay at Las Palomas. End of chapter 16